but not state firefighters, uh, not certain sworn officers, University of Wisconsin police, Capitol, both Capitol police, um, who are part of the general. What that pattern of selection in this newly created category does configure with are the uh, employees who are members of the only five unions in Wisconsin that supported Governor Walker's uh, election, the Republican governor that we have in 2010. So there were five unions. Members of all of those unions are part of this public safety uh, category. The challenge that we have is to the different treatment of these two categories of employees with respect to their collective bargaining rights and their ability to support their union. Um, the disfavored general employees, um, on the one hand, how they're treated, while the public safety employees, uh, the favored employees, are exempted. And there's three fundamental issues or ways in which uh, the law works that we say uh, violate equal protection. First of all, there is the virtually total prohibition on bargaining subjects that you heard about, where all that is left is total based wages. And by the way, that doesn't include overtime, merit pay, performance pay. Um, so it's a very, very narrow, virtually a shell of collective bargaining that's right for the, gen left for the general employees, while public safety employees have, <coughs> except for this change in health bargaining, all of the same subjects uh, remain mandatory subjects. If the law works a second um, uh, effect differently on employees with respect to dues deduction. For general employees, dues deduction um, and fair share agreements are prohibited. Not so for public safety employees who continue to have the right to have the, their union dues deducted. It fundamentally weakens the employee's rights to support their unions while allowing the public safety um, employees to support theirs. And finally, it makes it extremely difficult, prohibitively, we would say, difficult, um, to retain union representation by imposing, subjecting on the general employees this annual recertification election requirement um, no petition, no showing of interest uh, that there's anybody who wants to be certified. You have to go to election every single year. Only general employees are subjected to that, not public safety employees. Um, it, while the same differential treatment exists in the law for the health and pension contributions, uh, we are not seeking to enjoy those contributions. And that's in keeping with what the union position has been from the very start of this. Uh, they immediately said they would make the concessions on those economic issues. Um, and we have carried that out in terms of our litigation. That is not something we're seeking to change. We are obviously uh, saying that the differential treatment of these other areas that are fundamental to the ability to exist as a union and that restrict collective bargaining rights so differentially um, uh, are the subject matter, and that those differentiations have no rational basis, um, that there is not a legitimate government interest that the defendants can provide that would um, allow that kind of differential treatment to meet uh, the lowest level scrutiny, the rational basis test um, under the law. And while it is the lowest level scrutiny, it is not toothless. Uh, defendants have come back and said that they have a rationale. Their rationale uh, is that they wanted to have the broadest possible elimination of these rights um, without endangering public safety. Well, how do they get to endangering public safety by creating this exemption? What they Said, they, they, they speculate that coverage of the public safety employees could result in work stoppages of employees who provide essential services. And that while, yes, there are these different treatment within the protective services groupings, they uh, crafted this to uh, exclude, to carve out those 
um, those uh, protective services occupations that couldn't be replaced. They also point to uh, the different treatment of protective service employees um, when it comes to providing certain forms of um, impact resolution, binding arbitration. Binding arbitration uh, was not provided for police and fire at one point in time, not so for other public employees. And they say, look, this has been an accepted way of classifying employees for purposes of different treatment in the collective bargaining arena. That's all we need to show. That's enough to defeat your equal protection claim. Well, the fact that a distinction is found rational in one context doesn't make it rational in this particular context. The equal protection analysis um, does require that the defendant make a showing as to the particular legislation in question. So whatever the policy was that underlies subjecting one kind of union to an election every year to retain their certification rights from the supermajority, uh, there has not been articulated, and we say could not be articulated, a rational basis for exempting another kind of employee or union from that kind of requirement. And the same thing with respect to the dues deduction and the collective bargaining uh, restriction. They simply have not connected the dots in terms of showing um, the distinctions in the law are based on legitimate government's interests. Their speculation, and this is interesting in light of some of the comments today about the right to strike, uh, the, it's illegal in Wisconsin. And their speculation that use of uh, work stoppages as a basis for making these distinctions, we also assert is not a rational basis. Um, we cannot at least find any precedent justifying an exemption that is issued to mollify a group that's threatening illegal and public safety endangering conduct. Um, what really remains at the end of this analysis is that the difference in the treatment of these two classes is all we can see in political favoritism. And that is not considered a legitimate state interest. Um, in the absence of any uh, stated uh, rational basis and legitimate objective, that would be not enough to sustain the law. The second claim that uh, we're making is the, that this law discriminates um, in violation of the First Amendment. The government, and this goes to the issue of the dues deduction differential. Uh, the government uh, can subsidize uh, or facilitate private speech and association. It doesn't have to, and this is the decision in Eusursa versus Pocatello Association that the Supreme Court made in 2009. There's no requirement that the government um, allow for dues deduction in its system. But if it does do that, it has to do it even-handedly. And this sounds to me, I haven't read it, like the, what the, perhaps the uh, very general opinion in Virginia is saying. Union dues are used to support First Amendment activities. Um, unions do a referendum, uh, they, they advocate on issues, they lobby, they engage in endorsements. Um, all kinds of activities that are First Amendment protected. This act treats public safety employee unions differently. Um, and those unions, as I said, happen to have supported this governor. And um, by virtue of that differential treatment of allowing uh, the state mechanism of dues deduction, and I think everybody has said and agreed this is the most efficient and effective means of collecting dues by making that available to certain unions and denying it uh, to others, the, the law has engaged in viewpoint discrimination. The legislation uh, is vulnerable as viewpoint discrimination. Um, and that there is no neutral, viewpoint neutral rationale that would meet, and in this case, because First Amendment interests are implicated, we're looking at a heightened level of scrutiny. It's not 
it goes beyond the rational basis test. The defendants have not offered an independent rationale. Um, as I've indicated, we don't believe the workplace stoppages, public safety endangerment passes even rational basis muster. It certainly doesn't um, meet this heightened level of scrutiny. The, um, I'm going <laughs> to finish up, but I just want to suggest to you that there is a, a statement that was made the day the, pass of the act was passed. Not only interesting from a political perspective, but I think reinforces the viewpoint discrimination that we're alleging. This was by our majority leader, Scott Scott Fitzgerald, in an interview with Fox News on um, the day it was passed, saying if we win this battle, because you know there were lots of he passed the law, but he knew that four or five were coming. If we win this battle and the money is not there under the auspices of the unions, certainly what you're going to find is President Obama is going to have a much more difficult time getting elected and winning the state of Wisconsin. So, from his his words, not, not mine, <laughs> um, we think this law is vulnerable. We are awaiting that decision, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, not only in the Constitution, but what happens next in the Thank you. I'm a law professor. <laughs> He's an AD guy, he can do it. <laughs> well, we're getting this set up, uh, we're looking forward to uh, our panelists, uh, to Barbara. Uh, good luck. Uh, we'll paraphrase uh, Sarah Palin, who might not wish you good luck. Uh, uh, from St. Paul, where I live, I can see Wisconsin all yeah. over. <laughs> and I know, I, I know the game that's my sister's a high school school teacher in Jane. Uh, and the Hank, yeah, so a lot he's got to burn and Shirley. Uh, but we've got Mary Tyler Moore, we've got Prince, and, and we've got Darius and Stewart, all of whom are above everything. <laughs> okay, uh, I want to broaden the focus a little bit. Uh, in talking about the constitutional dimensions of public sector human right of change. Uh, I think it's important to remember that even though the current uh, financial uh, crisis is uh, really long and deep, it's not the only one we've had in recent years. If we go back over the stretch of the past 30 years, uh, we've had at least four significant public sector financial crises. And in each one, we've seen uh, public employers respond uh, in a natural way, trying to cut personnel costs. Ted Clark said this morning, they're they upwards of 70, 80 percent of many municipal uh, costs. Uh, most often, this is done at the bargaining table, but sometimes uh, employers or governmental employers have taken matters into their own hands and tried to unilaterally modify the terms of collective bargaining agreements that were negotiated when times were better. Uh, in fact, this slide shows that there's uh, actually sort of a historical progression in the strategies that tended to be used. In the 1980s, uh, governmental employers, uh, a number of them anyway, in the, in the published cases, uh, responded by trying to modify uh, the second or third years of collective bargaining agreements to take away uh, wages that were promised in the earlier years. 1990s, uh, the strategy turned to what were called lag payroll schemes, which was actually delaying when public employees were paid salaries and essentially extracting loans from those workers. The strategy de jure in the, the current uh, decade is furloughs mandatory time off without pay. Uh, you're probably asking now, probably thinking labor lawyers out there, uh, to the extent that an employer is unilaterally modifying the terms of a collective bargaining agreement, isn't that uh, an unfair labor practice? 
We know in the private sector that employer cannot modify an agreement just because they're in financial tough times. In, in, and it's not just existing agreements. When the agreement expires, the employer must bargain the impasse before it can take any sort of unilateral action. Well, yeah, that's the private sector. But in the public sector, the rules <coughs> tend to be a little bit uh, more hazy. Uh, we've got issues of statutory preemption uh, in some jurisdictions where a statute might uh, perhaps can't be modified through collective bargaining. We've got issues of narrower scope of bargaining in some jurisdictions. We've got the impact of a mandated impasse procedure. Uh, but what I want to talk about is what I call diffused management authority. Unilateral change that may occur because of the separation of powers in governmental bodies. So take these two constitutional dimensions which I want to talk about. You may have an executive branch that negotiates a collective bargaining agreement, signs it on the bottom line, but it's up to a legislative body, most often the state legislature for state employees, that has the power over the purse. Most, not all, but most states' constitutions provide that only a legislative body can appropriate funds uh, to fund state operations. So you may have an executive branch that negotiates an agreement, but uh, a legislative branch that declines to pay for it. Also, the separation of powers comes up when you've got a state legislature that's got the power to make law and decides to make a law that modifies the terms of an existing agreement negotiated by an executive branch. Now again, the labor lawyers are thinking, but still, isn't that uh, an unfair labor practice? Uh, not really, not in, the, in these two contexts. A unilateral change is an unfair labor practice only if undertaken by a, an employer. But most state bargaining laws define a public employer as some executive branch entity, not a state legislature. So if a state legislature with lawmaking authority modifies an existing agreement, the only claim is not a ULP claim, it's a constitutional law claim. So let's talk about our two uh, contexts here, starting out with the appropriations context. Again, let's assume we've got an executive that negotiates, a legislative body that does the funding. Here's a classic example, the Bush, well it was Governor Bush back then, Jeb Bush, but police benevolent association versus state of Florida case from 2002. There's a bunch of these cases out there. But the state executive had negotiated an agreement providing for a 5% wage increase. The legislature, uh, the, the agreement was submitted to the state legislature, which said here's enough money to fund 2.5% of those increases. That's all you're going to get. Uh, the unions challenged the legislature's action. Uh, and it was held uh, to be lawful that essentially the executive branch contract was only enforceable to the extent that the legislature funded it. If the legislature doesn't fund it, that's all there is uh, under the appropriations authority. There's a number of cases that have also said the same thing with respect to interest arbitration awards, that even if a state employer uh, submits a dispute to interest arbitration, if the legislature refuses to fund the interest arbitration award, uh, it is not an enforceable contract. Here's a midterm uh, variation of this appropriation issue. Uh, in this city of Philadelphia case, the school district had the authority by constitution and statute to negotiate agreements but only the city council had the authority to provide funds for the agreement. It was a two-year agreement, and the city council gave enough money for the first year, but after that year passed, the second year came up, the city council said, times have changed, we're not going to fund that agreement for a second year. And the excuse me, Pennsylvania court said, we find this agreement severable and the city council's actions to be lawful. I think the mid-contract situation is a little 
uh, dicier, if you will, uh, because there's been some expectations created uh, that were built up over this time, and there's been a lot of criticism of cases such as this, but uh, this is a possible uh, unilateral change in the constitutional basis. Now, I should say that there's some, clearly some limitations on this appropriations authority. In some states, uh, ratification by a legislative body coincides with the cycle of the contracts. Therefore, uh, the legislature has to do all or nothing, so there is no midterm unilateral change. And in this Florida case, uh, the Supreme Court recognized sort of a one bite at the apple rule. That is, the uh, legislature has the right to deny appropriations when they get the contract first, but if they make the appropriations, they can't come back at a later time and say, times have changed, now we want to take that, uh, that increase back. So one chance on appropriations with that step. Which leads me to talk about our most recent case on this topic out of California, uh, Professional Engineers versus Schwarzenegger. You may have heard, heard that name. Uh, California had a pretty darn bad financial crisis, and Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, well, here, let me go to the sequence. September 2008, uh, collective bargaining agreements for state employees were submitted to the legislature for funding. Uh, the legislature adequately funded the contracts at the amounts negotiated. December 2008, things were deteriorating uh, in California and elsewhere, and Governor Schwarzenegger unilaterally reduces uh, the cost of the contracts by imposing uh, unpaid furlough days on state employees. February uh, uh, 2009, the legislature revises its initial budgetary bill downward and basically essentially gratifies the, uh, the furlough plan by the governor. The unions, not very happy, sued. California Supreme Court in 2010 rules as follows. Governor Schwarzenegger, or any governor in California, does not have the authority to unilaterally modify collective bargaining agreements, memorandum of understanding, as it's called in, in California, uh, on a unilateral basis. It doesn't work. But the state legislature's action in revising the budget was effective to modify the collective bargaining agreements and it sort of underscores the separation of powers again. One of the, I think, thorny issues in this case is that it seems contrary to the one bite uh, of the apple that the Florida case I mentioned earlier did. Because here, the state legislature had actually ratified the contract in 2008 with the budget bill and then in the following year, enacted a second budget bill, and the California Supreme Court said, well, they can do that. And this is a very long and complicated opinion, and maybe that they can do it because the Bills Act, the Collective Bargaining Act for, uh, for these state employees, uh, arguably reserves the legislature's uh, right to do this, although it's not clear from the opinion. But there, there's another sort of uh, caveat here, I think, the employee unions did not challenge the governor's actions on a contract clause basis. Uh, and I think you may have an arguable contract clause claim against the legislature's action to modify the contract in this context. Which gets me to the second issue, the lawmaking issue where a legislature modifies or attempts to modify a contract that's already been negotiated and funded, it's still in existence. So this is different than the appropriation context. Uh, Derek Mayer this morning talked about the contract clause and how it applies pensions. It applies here as well, uh, perhaps even more so. In the pension case, there's an initial issue about whether pensions established by state law are actually contracts. But it's clear that a collective bargaining agreement is a contract, so we can jump right to steps two and three. Has the legislature's action substantially impaired a contract? And then there's the safety valve 
Uh, even if the answer to that one is yes, a legislature may still take unilateral action if such is reasonable and necessary to serve uh, an important public purpose. And I'll go through this one quick because Eric talked about this too. In uh, uh, 1977, the U.S. Supreme Court said that's the test of when a government tries to modify its own contractual obligation. Well, we're going to look at it more closely because the, the state's self-interest is at stake. So we're not just going to defer to it broadly. Well, over the past 30 years, we've seen about uh, 20 published cases dealing with contract clause violations. And uh, a majority of these cases, although that majority seems to be shrinking, is uh, demonstrated by uh, the service case out of New York in 1993. That was a lag payroll case. The Second Circuit uh, said that by essentially forcing the employees to borrow money to the state through this delayed payroll scheme, there was a substantial modification of the party's collective bargaining agreements. The question then was that reasonable and necessary for a governmental purpose? And uh, the, the court system said, yes, we have a financial emergency. Uh, 1993 followed in the, the second set of uh, recession I had in my, my list before. Uh, but the Second Circuit said, no, we don't buy it in this context. And they focused on uh, the third bullet here, that it wasn't reasonable to place the financial burden on the shoulders of the few employees rather than than widely uh, on the taxpayers as a whole. Now that's probably representative of, of the majority of cases, uh, but the uh, city of Baltimore Teachers Union uh, is, uh, is uh, illustrative of another viewpoint on these cases. City of uh, Baltimore, or the school district, is going through top financial times during the same set of recession years and implemented a furlough plan for school district employees. Yeah. Argued that that was necessary because it had taken other steps that weren't sufficient to balance the budget. And in this case, the Fourth Circuit upheld the, the school's action, saying that it was reasonable uh, to take this action because, quote, public servants might well be called upon to sacrifice first. So a little different approach than that in uh, uh, the Second Circuit, which says, let's share this pain broadly. Um, this decision says, well, public employees are in a special position, uh, and they should, they should be expected to, uh, to give back first because of that special position. Four recent decisions, the four most recent decisions uh, that have been published in this arena uh, seem to illustrate that we've got a growing amount of deference that the courts are giving to public employers in this arena. City of Buffalo, which clearly had a horrible financial problem in the earlier uh, mid 2000s, uh, implemented a unilateral reduction in, uh, in, in wage rates, and the Second Circuit upheld that. Uh, and in doing so, they gave substantial deference to the city's determination of just how bad it was. Uh, little attention there with the U.S. trust case. Eighth Circuit, uh, usually the most liberal, uh, struck down the uh, city of Benton, Benton Missouri's uh, unilateral change, finding that there wasn't really an emergency here. It wasn't reasonable and necessary. Prince George's County in Maryland in 2010, the Fourth Circuit upheld unilateral change, finding that there was no impairment because the county really had reserved the right through a resolution to make such a change. Uh, so we don't have to determine whether it's reasonable and necessary. And then just this year, out of Puerto Rico, the Fortuno case, the First Circuit Circuit upheld a unilateral change. Man, first circuit, I'm sure that's possible too. Uh, upheld a uh, unilateral change, 
on an interesting basis. They said, like the Buffalo case, we think that the burden of proving reasonable and necessary should not be on the employer, but on the challenging unions. They said, we admit that maybe in some tension with uh, U.S. trust, but we think that's the best way to interpret uh, this provision. And since the burden's on the unions, uh, and we now have plausible pleading standards under Quamley and Kickwall, I know that's Latin to the nine lawyers there, uh, basically, we're not even going to consider the case because it wasn't pled with sufficient uh, specificity of the actual harm to result in a very interesting case. Well, um, I think I'm about done here, right? Time is what I said. I'll just, I'll just say this. Uh, two suggestions. Uh, uh, to the extent constitutionally permissible, it seems to me the appropriations matter should be handled by having the appropriations approval and the contract approval, the contract cycle running for the same duration that would diminish the mid-term unilateral change, which is the, the, the most uh, dicey of those. And in terms of collective bargaining agreements and unilateral change under the contract laws, I guess my belief is that public employee contracts should be treated the same as contracts for other goods and services and not be the first in line for impairment, uh, but should be treated the same as everything else. So contrary to what Baltimore teachers said, I, I don't think that public employee contracts should be treated as second class or first class obligation. Thanks. We do have time for a few questions. The first one will be asked by me. Sorry. Uh, and, and that is, uh, I'm just curious, do you all think that the resolution of the issues that you all have talked about will have an effect on whether workers will decide or decline to enter public sector employment in the future? Uh, I definitely do. Uh, I, I think one of the things we saw in Wisconsin uh, with the outpouring uh, against this bill was also pent up frustration and uh, anger at the way in which the public employees have been scapegoated in this time of fiscal crisis. And so uh, you also saw families, friends of, of teachers, these are people who work in the communities, live in the communities, feeling that their uh, public servants are under attack. And if that continues, if that um, barrage of criticism doesn't subside, and if people don't feel like they can progress in terms of a standard of living. I, mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's going to play a role. Now, you have to temper that by saying jobs are hard to get. <laughs> but it's certainly taking a toll on the morale of public employees, and that's going to take a toll on the services that we need. Yeah, I saw in, in one of the newspapers that in Wisconsin this school year, uh, double the amount of retirements happened as compared to the prior years. So I think that's indication of what Barbara says. And Steve, it's also an indication of what you said, because people are very afraid that their contract rights might be impaired in the future. So. Okay. Uh, additional questions? Yes. Uh, this is for Barbara Clinton. I look forward to reading the briefs, but I was wondering, do you know of other courts that have either rejected the distinction between public safety employees and other employees, or rejected distinctions among public safety employees? Yes, and, and there are three cases that are cited in the outline um, where that has happened, and the courts have uh, said that there wasn't a rational basis in those cases for distinguishing among, amongst the employees, and uh, in particularly um, with the uh, distinction, one of the cases around distinguishing between the med police and fire. Uh, so yes, there are. Yes. Just fix the Wisconsin issue. Um, the disparity amongst the public safety unions and the uh, regular employee unions as far as their, uh, their reduction in rights. Um, it, my question goes to the strike issue. Um, is that something that was negotiated that the unions approached the, uh, the governmental leadership, or was that something they offered up as a compromise to try to maybe keep the heat off them? And maybe uh, if you could possibly forecast that this year they slipped through, but next year they may be the ones who are targeted 
and they're going to lose their rights just to, to divide and conquer. Um, you know, it's supposed to take everybody out at the same time. Okay, there's, there's a couple of things there. I, I would say that there was a long period of time after, because of this injunction that had been issued, um, the legislation went through in March, and the legislature did not know whether this pending state court action was indeed going to require them to vote again. So there was the possibility of taking a revote on this issue throughout the spring. And one of the questions was, gee, if this distinction amongst employees, and by the way, there was a big outcry from municipal governments who said, um, you know, police and fire are the biggest part of our budget, and you're exempting them from the tools that you say, you know, are supposed to make for flexibility. So there was a lot of pushback on, on that, in that way. Um, what I'm saying is, there, and then there were some changes in the law, some technical fixes that went in with the budget bill in June before the injunction was lifted. There was an opportunity to um, change this distinction, to lump everybody together and say we're taking it away for everybody. And the legislature did not do that. And Governor Walker said publicly a few times that that is not going to happen, which further led to the belief that this is a political decision that has been made, um, not one, you know, grounded in, in a rational basis. Um, so would it happen in the future? Interestingly enough, with the recall elections, uh, our legislature, the composition has changed. It's still a Republican Senate, um, but the, it's 17 to 16, and that's 17 Republican did not vote for this legislation. Only Republican who didn't vote for it. So if we are successful, and that is found to be a, a, a fatal flaw in the structure of the act, I do think it's an open question whether or not um, they could pass an act that would include it. Other questions? Thank you so much. We are, are done with this particular panel. We don't actually have a break moving to the next one, so hopefully folks will move very quickly uh, and do whatever they need to do, and we'll come back and start almost immediately. Thank you all very much. Thank you, panel.